Всички. А, поредното купче на съобщения, знаете си вече, OpenFest 15, гривнички, горе има мата, водичка и тъна. А, ако имате въпроси, заповядайте. А, now. А, гривничките са, за да може да получите безплатна бира утре, отстъпки в някои околни заведения и разни други блогинки. Sorry, what? Така, по-добре ли? Окей, so uh, our next uh, lecture, our next presenter is Achis uh, Elenius. Did I say it right? Correctly. Okay. Uh, he's an independent journalist. Uh, he's working for a project that involves all the European states and it's concerned with free and open source. Um, he's running some strange window managers. He's quite experienced, I suppose. Right? Not in, the, not in the strange window managers, but in your journalistic profession. Uh, today he's going to talk about the free and open source software in the European institutions and in the European Union. Round of applause, please. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy. Uh, I'm very happy. I'm honored, actually, to be here. It's my first time in Bulgaria, for the first time in Sofia. I have, um, I need to bend something. No, I think it's fine. Can anybody, everybody hear me? Okay. I'm turning up and down the volume. I have a, a whole bunch of slides on my talk. I will try to go through them as fast as humanly possible, and I hope you can follow it. Are we doing this in English? I'm sorry, I do not speak Bulgarian. It's on my list. Not yet. Not yet. That's what I said. So the title, Free and Open Source Policies and Implementations in Public Administrations. I specifically limit myself to talk only about public administrations, governments, ministries, towns, what have you. start out with a little disclaimer. When I talk about open source, I basically talk about free software. For me, it's synonymous. Uh, as a journalist, I like to mix things, but uh, if I say open source, you should listen and hear me say free software. And the other is I do not speak on behalf of the European Commission. I do work for one of their projects. It's where all of my work is published, but it's not their opinion. The first few slides are opinions that I've gathered the past few years from people that work in public administrations in Spain or in Finland or in Malta that have <coughs> worked with open source and concluded that free and open source software is the only way that governments can innovate and modernize. The main reason that they find it is cost and they very quickly after that discover that it gives them an enormous amount of flexibility. Public administrations are also finding out that using open source, you can actually share your solutions. So you have one town that has an application for a renewing of your driver's license, and they can give it to the town next door and they can use it as well. And by doing this, they create opportunities for businesses to use the code that public administrations make to improve it and build services around it. I'll give you a lot of examples on these things. It's basically paying it forward. So it's a change. Instead of sinking your costs in US-based uh, uh, big software firms, you're paying it into a system that generates growth locally. There's a lot of examples from all over Europe that this is starting to happen. It's a, it's a long... It's a slow uh, process. It takes a long time. You even have examples of Swiss, French, and German public administrations that sit together and say, OK, we're using LibreOffice. We have some trouble with uh, documents that are sent to us in another format, not open document format. Can we fix this? And they put together some money, and they paid SUSE in Germany, and they fixed some of these issues. And these fixes are available to everybody. So it, it's funded by Swiss, France, and Germany, but it's used now in the England as well. 
And an interesting trend that I start to see is that there are civic hackers, people basically in this room today, that are starting to ask their government, hey, all your code should be made public because it's public information, just as your documents. I'll give you an example later on on how this is happening in France. But that's an interesting trend. So first, a little bit about this talk. We're already halfway. I'll give you the big trends. I'll give you the four problem areas, the way I see them. I'll give you the three most visible implementations in Europe. I'll give you, I'll talk a little bit about the two largest desktop implementations. I'll give you some practical strategies, sorry, <coughs> some practical strategies. And for those of you that work in public administrations or that want to communicate to people that work in public administrations, here are five steps to help you move to open source. But I first talk a little bit about the projects that I work for. It's called OZOR, that's the abbreviation, Open Source Observatory and Repository. We don't only aggregate information, we also try to collect software tools. So we talk to a lot of public administrations all over the 28 member states. And by now we have collected 4,000 such tools made by Andalusia or made by a Swedish uh, part of the defense ministry that are useful to others. We basically don't host them, but we try to make sure that the links are there and other people can find it. We have agreements with 12 governments that have similar repositories, and we call that federation. So information on our site, uh, uh, our site gives access to those repositories and vice versa. If people on, say, the French government repository look for a certain tool, they might find solutions on their French hard disks, but they could also find them on the European Commission's hard disks or in the ones from the Austrian government. So we have Andalusia, Catalonia, France, and there's 12 in total. And the observatory, the part that I have been doing for the past few years, we're collecting an enormous amount of news items and case studies, and we're working on making sure that the CIOs of member states, the IT leaders of public administrations, are aware of this, aware of the long trends. So the last bullet point, the innovation champions. We have the chief IT person at the European Commission. We have Liam Maxwell, the CIO of the, of the UK government. And we have um, uh, Marzin, the uh, outgoing CIO of France with statements on how useful it is for their countries and their institutions to use open source. So the big trends. Public administrations are everywhere in Europe turning to free and open source. Ten years ago, they were experimenting with this and public administrations would do a, a press release because they were enthusiastic. These days, Nobody talks about it anymore, but if I call a town, any town, maybe even in Bulgaria, and I'll ask them, they'll say, yeah, sure, we have Linux service here, and we use Drupal or some other content management system. Particularly interesting is the quote by the French Gendarmerie. It is one of the bigger uh, implementations in Europe, but they discovered that if you do this, it lowers your TCO, your total cost of ownership, by 40%. And then they say, Costs are interesting, but by moving everything in our system to open source, we were able to start actually negotiating with vendors. For the first time in all those years, we actually had something to negotiate. And it has helped us to drive ITIL, ETIL, through our IT infrastructure, get a better grip on what we're doing with IT. The other big trend, the number of politicians that understand, appreciate, that use open source, is slowly rising. 10 years ago, they were non-existent. Now you can find them in almost every country. Here's just one example. Um, I'll share the slides, but all of these are links to articles. These are two MEPs, Julia Reda from the Pirate Party in Germany and Max Andersen from the Green Party in Sweden who were elected to the European Parliament uh, last year. And one of the first things they did is ask the European Commission 
to start making sure that what the Commission does in code, and the Commission does a lot of open source code, actually goes upstream. And they, these two MEPs are trying to find out how can we make the Commission become part of the community. So, the big trend, public administrations use free and open source software for everything. This is not a list uh, as any that's uh, randomly sorted. But you can find it literally anywhere. Content management systems, document management systems, databases, basically for a lot of their e-government services. EID, I think it's the topic tomorrow. The geographic information systems, it's rapidly growing there. On open data, almost every country has a CCAN engine under their open data portal. And a lot of open source software development tools. So not only all types, but you also find it across all sectors. Let's start with Bulgaria. Oops, one too far. So I could use a few more news items on Bulgaria, actually. I'm always trying to, I, I look on the Bulgarian Linux forums, I look on, uh, on uh, websites from the ministries where I use uh, translation engines to uh, translate it into English. These are just a few from the last few years. Um, most of this will be uh, common knowledge to you guys. The last one is a case study that we published. You'll find it in the European institutions. This is one of the bigger public administrations in Europe. And yeah, so there's hundreds of people, oops, sorry about that, hundreds of people there, and uh, uh, there's a lot of IT development, and a lot of that is now done on open source. Open source is the preferred platform for software development in the Commission since a while. This one is from December. European Commission has been working on an update to its, uh, to its policy, and they, they realized that they use an enormous amount of open source. Basically, all the websites of the Commission run Drupal. Uh, there's hundreds of servers in the Commission institutes that run Red Hat Linux, and so on. And I already told you that their basic, that their preferred development environment these days is open source. But they decided that the distance between, say, the consumer part and the becoming part of the open source community, that the step that needs to be closed. And so the latest addition to their open source policy is that they're really going to try to, be, to submit their code upstream and work with, for example, the Drupal development people. If the commission finds a bug, or if the commission builds a, a module, that it is really um, handed over upstream. This is an interesting one. Again, all these links are, uh, will bring you to the website of the Commission. I will briefly click on it and see what happens. Exactly nothing. There we go. Here you have the article. You also then see the website. This is from uh, 2013. The Commission hires new IT staffers every so many times and um, they do big tests. And it just happened that I heard from one of the guys who was there that they had to answer the question, if you were to manage the transition of one part of the commission to open source, how would you do that? So I contacted a few people who wrote this item because there were 200 IT people that sat in that exam, which means the commission now has 200 ways to uh, change the direct uh, directorate to open source. Anyway, back to business. You find it in ministries. This is a case study that we did, the, f the first one, the French ministries. They did a several million euro support contract a few years ago, where they specifically said we have these 252 open source tools that we use all across our ministries. Who can give us support on all of them? And a bunch of French uh, companies uh, got the contract. And the ministry is very happy to, for the first time in their long life, are able to follow bugs that they uncover, that they come across, and how the software company says, yeah, it's the bug and we're fixing it, and it's in this version, and that's not the version that is currently uh, by the developers, so we're maintaining a fork 
for the ministries. So, but we've uh, our code is in, uh, in is in upstream. So once we manage to upgrade our software, the bug will be fixed. But we're anyway. So they get some kind of transparency over their IT that they've never had before. Just thought I should show you. It's really all over Europe. You find it in a lot of regional governments. There are, of course, oops, sorry about that. A lot of, I should tell me when it's the last one. The, um, there's a lot of regions in Europe. Uh, Spain has 17 autonomous regions. Uh, Switzerland, sorry, uh, Italy has a lot of provinces and uh, regions. And all of these work slowly but surely on policies and plans and activities. And you'll find it in towns and tiny villages. For example, the second one, uh, Fiera del Minho, is a tiny town in Portugal. They're hard to find, these towns that use Linux already for 10 years, but this is one of them. I, by complete coincidence, I managed to find out about them, and we uh, interviewed the IT manager there, and he said, yeah, it was not really... Uh, a big discussion. We didn't have that much money to buy all these things, so we did it with open source, and we've been doing it already for 10 years. And I would very much like to be able to compare this town, which has two IT people, and it maybe has, uh, uh, say, 100,000 inhabitants, probably less, to another town in Portugal that doesn't, and then see where is their IT budget going. That's actually the fourth link in the, the I'm from the Netherlands, so the Dutch town of Ede. I happen to know where it is. That's the first time we were able to do this, because we had everything from the city of Ede. We know how much they spend. We know how, much, how many IT staffers they have. And we have, for the country, a comparison tool. And so we concluded that they have 92% less license costs than, their, than towns of, their, uh, of comparable size. You find it in, in literally in all sectors. In healthcare, there's a lot in healthcare. Again, all over Europe. These are individual projects. That's something I try to, uh, to, to help these people with. If I contact a hospital in, uh, in Poland, I will tell them about similar hospitals in other member states, hoping that these people will start working together. Language problems are, um, language barriers are, are a problem here, unfortunately. But for example, the last link in Liège, in Belgium, uh, where I live and work, the hosp hospitals are using a lot of open source tools and they're actually building uh, tools that help them do medical scanners. And here, the last link is a, uh, it, it is a proprietary patient record system that was funded by the UK's healthcare system, NHS, and last year, NHS and the firm started this discussion, and the firm said, okay, well, it's basically your software anyway, and they open sourced it. It's also an interesting trend. You'll find it in the defense sector. Again, sorry about that. The last thing I find is interesting because um, the Russian government at a certain point decided that the American influence on their uh, IT industry was too big, and they made this law where they said, we will start moving everything to open source. And two or three days before that law was introduced, friends of the big powerful man in Russia started investing in all kinds of open source firms in Russia. So they knew where the wind was blowing. And you'll find it in schools, hopefully soon in schools in Bulgaria too. Again, um, Extremadura, one of the poorest regions of Spain in the south, on the border with Portugal. It's not just a lack of resources, financial resources. They also have a strong belief that this is the right way to go. And so they're investing a lot. There you'll find hundreds of thousands of schools, sorry, students in schools, that use Ubuntu versions made specifically for those schools in, uh, in Extremadura. Um, this is a school in, uh, in another part of Spain where once rolled out, the IT said, 
A, I now no longer have any trouble with my PCs. There's no downtime, there's no viruses, no spam, there's no, the kids don't break them. There's a lot of those anecdotes, always. This is a, a Greek tool developed by a teacher who had to, because that's how his school was, had to oversee a class here and a class there. And he couldn't be in two places at the same time. And so he wrote a management tool that's made available uh, as open source and is used rapidly across uh, Greece, where he is able to steer all the desktops in both classrooms. So now he is available in two rooms at the same time. And here's a quote I think you, uh, you will all uh, appreciate from Malcolm Moore, who manages the uh, Westcliff High School for Girls Academy in the UK, where they also did a rapid move. They meant all the laptops, all the desktops in the school classrooms went to uh, Ubuntu. And this is why, he said, my students will end up at Google or in CERN. Uh, that's, they'll have to know something. They'll, you know, that's where they'll work with Linux, so we better start teaching them. So far, that's all good news. Here's a few things that are not going so well. The first problem is that there is really a lack of political support. So I said earlier that the number of politicians that understand it is rising, but we can still count them on these 10 fingers. And it's not enough. We need politicians to recognize the value of open source. They need to be able to understand that this has to do with responsible government, with sustainability, with openness, with transparency, independence from IT vendors, with making competition possible. And they should realize that there is this link between the money you spend in the IT of a government and how that can be turned into some kind of fund for, for companies and firms and businesses and individuals. And here's the former CIO of the Basque country in Spain, and this is how he said it. Free and open source software creates a virtuous loop between the public and the private sector. Where the public push is a recurrent public contribution. Um, there is a political science student who looked basically on a lot of the articles that we wrote uh, and decided to do some kind of sample in the Netherlands. And he talked to all the IT people in all the municipalities in the country and to the city councils. And his conclusions are that if you have political support, you'll get already very, very far with making sure that your political organization will start moving to open source. But the other thing you need is a pioneer, an innovation champion, somebody who will talk who will be able to convince them and say, if there's an issue, I'll fix it. And if, um, if, you have a, uh, if you have a problem with the desktop, I will find an IT person that can explain to you how you should do it, or we'll figure out what was wrong, or whether it's based, whether it's Linux fault, or open source's fault, or whether it has something else. One anecdote here I would share with you is uh, from the city of Munich in Germany. It will come up later, but it will be a different anecdote. But there I department took 10 years to move from their Windows-based environment to a complete Linux-based environment. And they ran into a lot of headwind. People were angry, people did not agree with the change, and there were a lot of, it's 21 different IT centers, and they had a lot of clashes with the other IT departments to centralize it and standardize on Linux. But they had the major the mayor of Munich was completely in support of this move, and every time there was something really a headache, they would go to the mayor and say, okay, well, these are the two ways. And it really helped them to make sure that they got where they wanted. I said politicians, there are not enough politicians, and they're not aware enough, or they don't appreciate it enough, but um, that's maybe the easy way out, because we can say, yeah, okay, it's the politician's fault. That's not the only thing. When you, the author of this study here is in the room, sitting right there. But when you look at um, ways that governments handle their IT changes, you can, you can say cost should be a driver. Yeah, you have short term and long term. And ours is the long term. 
But when you need to make a decision, shall we do uh, an upgrade to LibreOffice or shall we renew our uh, Microsoft Office licenses? And if Microsoft then has a nice discount, then yeah, you know, exit costs, the transition costs, training the users, you get all that. Of course, the, the desktop lock-in is, or the lock-in, IT lock-in is very strong. Um, and it's a, it's a really big threshold for public administrations to go over. There is legal uncertainty. There's a lot of IT people that are not sure. They haven't really understand. They haven't really understood the open source. They haven't really worked with it. They, they confuse it with other things. They say it's unsafe because it's open. There's a lot of FUD that needs to be overwhelmed. It's perceived as, as risky. And this is somewhat true. That you could say there is a, a lack of leading examples. The European Commission's Open Source Observatory is by now starting to show that there's actually uh, examples everywhere in any kind of scale, in any kind of project. The CIO of the UK government, Liam Maxwell, I already mentioned him. He's one of our um, innovation champions. He wrote a letter, he sent an email, to all the IT heads in the UK government saying, you will not get fired if you do open source. That was a very strong message. And we need a bit more of those. You need political support to push your CIO, but you need your CIO to push your IT people. And the CIO needs to be protected because he will get a lot of friction. He will get a lot of pushback. And when you have a large public administration you, have, you deal with thousands of desktops or thousands of services, very quickly you will have very big procurement frameworks and that will favor the big firms. And nah, the big firms have issues with open source because it changes their business model. That's it. Politicians need to become more aware of it. I'm not blaming the politicians. We can't blame the politicians. There's a whole bunch of tools that they can use to get there. The second problem is that the vendor lock-in on the desktop is really, really strong. It's nothing new for you guys. Even the European Commission admits that it's locked in. As uh, uh, the head of the Commission uh, wrote last year, the current captivity situation as regards to desktop operating systems and productivity tools is not new, and it's not limited to the Commission either. They would really love to see more public administrations change to open source. And they need to give the good example, and it's very difficult for them to do that. It's do as I say, not do as I do, because the Commission has never, in its 20 years of existence, the past 20 years, ever procured its desktop operating system or its desktop office licenses. They always have a negotiated procedure. They find legal ways to go around, because they have no choice. But they're trying to get rid of it, slowly. I'll try to uh, introduce you to that. And the th third problem is that the playing field is very uneven. You have so many examples of, and I every now and then look at those, procurement proposals from public administrations, and they basically just say, we want Microsoft, we want Oracle, we want IBM. They, and that's just not allowed. That's not how you should do it. There's a few funny situations there. Uh, I dealt with one of these in uh, Romania, where the police force did a, a public procurement call. And they said, we forbid open source license, GPL licenses, to enter into this uh, contract. And so I called them. That was very funny, because um, I'm not from the commission, but I say, that I work for the project of the European Commission. They missed the first part. They heard the Commission part, and they were very impressed that somebody from the Commission called them to ask them about this paragraph 5 on, par on page 10 on this procurement procedure that forbade open source. And then they pulled, they took it off the website, and they published a new one where that wasn't in the, the thing wasn't in there anymore. I have another one which is funny, and this is something you should remember. You can use it yourself. But a lot of public administrations go to the European Regional Development Fund to fund some of their projects. And you had the, um, was the f I think, the, uh, all the fire departments in Poland. And they asked for, uh, they had a project, and they asked 
I forget what it was, probably office licenses or operating systems, it doesn't really matter, it was proprietary, and I called them, together with the Free Software Foundation in Poland called FWIRO. They had alerted me to it, and I called the fire department people, and I said, um, I, are you sure this is what you want to do? Because that's not how procurement law, you cannot say, I want only Mercedes cars. You have to say, I want cars. So then Fiat and Simca and Mercedes and, and Daft Trucks, they all have a chance. And, and, and then I called the European Regional Development Fund there in Brussels. And at that time, they had a spokesperson who spoke Dutch, and I happened to know him. And I said, hey, um, there's this procurement going around in Poland, and it's a big project, and they're asking for um, proprietary licenses. And he said, okay, well, it's great that you tell me. I'll just make a note. And if they send me the invoice, I'll just tell them, yeah, you broke the procurement rules. You won't get the money. When I told that to the fire department, they pulled the tender and published a new text. I tried to do this also in Spain. It didn't work there. So sometimes there are... Um... Now, procurement is a big problem. Yeah, there is a group in, uh, in Brussels, Open Forum Europe, and they actually look all the time at... Uh, every three months, they look at all the procurements that are published uh, and aggregated at the European level, and they conclude that it's, it's like... One in five is off. Uh, so many public administrations basically ask for a specific brand or a specific product, and they do not do technical specifications, and therefore block any competitor from entering. If you're really into this uh, topic, you really will like uh, these two talks. The second one... Um, sorry, the first one is from a, uh, a PhD student, sorry, it's not a, a professor in uh, Groningen, university teacher in Groningen, who did his PhD on public procurement, and he looked at the European Commission's lack of procurement for its office licenses and operating systems on the desktop. And he basically butchers the legal arguments that the European Commission uh, legal specialists use to defend the fact that they cannot ask for, uh, they cannot do an open call. Um, and he has been trying to get the commission to reply, but they have sort of kept the door closed because, well, they kind of realize that they're in a, in a bind, but there's nothing much they can do. And then there's a fourth problem, is that there is a lack of experience. It's just very new still to public administrations. And so, even at the commission, they don't always know, okay, so we have this code, we've, uh, we, have, we lose a, use a lot of Drupal, and one of our developers came with this nice module, and we, how, do we, how do we publish it? And which name do we use? Does it say European Commission? Or does it say Dimitri, who wrote the code? And, and what copyright license do we use? And, and so on. The, the team of my project talked to everybody in the European Commission that needed to be talked to, and we figured out that there are no legal objections for any public administration anywhere in Europe to, ex to release their code as open source. You can do this. You have every right to give away your assets using an open source license. Here's the, uh, the head, of, head of sector. It's not, not the big boss, but he's, he's quite high up. At the uh, Directorate for IT, Digit, the Ministry for IT, say, at the European Commission. And he so he says, we use a lot of open source I already said so, everywhere. We adapt it, we integrate it, and it's really time that we give it back. And even he came with this question, but how do I do that? And, he, and so then we had to give him this document that we had prepared already three years ago, that, they, so as I said, it, they're unaware, and they don't always know where to look. And not everybody always goes to the OSR where the answer will be right there. You have to find it, too. On legal objections, there is an interesting anecdote from Switzerland where there was a... There is the High Court in Switzerland, and they built a document management system specifically for their court. And when it was done, they decided, now what? You know what? We'll publish it as open source. And then you, you might be aware, Switzerland is organized in cantons, and a few of the other cantons said, hey, that's an interesting tool. We want to use that as well. And so the cantons started to reuse the open, that means I have 10 minutes? No problem. The open source tool developed by the central court. And there was a proprietary competitor who said that he was now afraid to lose his market. And he took the court to court. And he took it to the court 
that wrote the code that he was taking them to court with. Anyway, the court looked at this whole thing, and they said, sorry, you have, you're, not, you're not a company. You're not offering services. You're not hiring hands. You're not, it's just the code. You have every right to do that. And so the case was thrown out, luckily. And there are really a lot of good examples. I, I see I, uh, the Switzerland Supreme Court. That's the article that I just told you about. EMEO is a, um, is a Belgian IT service supplier. It used to be part of the government. It was made independent, but it still works for a lot of governments. You have hundreds of municipalities that use this firm to build applications, online applications, e-government services. It's all on Plone and Zopi and other open source tools. And they're all reusing it. They're pooling their resources. It makes it cheaper for all of them to have a common base. The Dutch government, their, uh, part of their ID uh, infrastructure needed something to be changed in some part of the Apache web infrastructure that they used. It wasn't very complex, but they needed something to do it. They didn't have to do a call for tender because it wasn't very big, but they organized so that the New Zealand developer, who was a specialist, could write the code and change the thing specifically for the Dutch EID thing to go on, and it's now part of the upstream project. You have the French project, Project Adulact, which is actually the model for the Ozor project that I work for. They, France is like a real great country, they, they saw this already decades ago, and here's, it's a volunteer group of French civil servants that work on open source. Open Mary, one guy in one town started building open source tools, there's now tens of tools that they are sharing with many other towns and municipalities in uh, France. Munich, I will deal with that, but I think I have to rush. Andalusia and the European Commission. Hang on. Andalusia is interesting. We just this week published a case study on their um, solution. They use a complete open source mail server stack, so groupware, calendaring, email, what have you, for hundreds of thousands of users. And it's four euros per user per year. And that is so cheap that sometimes they have vendors come in and say, we have a mail server stack too, and then they hear four euros per desktop per year, per user per year, forget it, and they leave, because there's no way they can do it. Okay, for uh, being short on time, I'll skip this slide. Um, no, actually I won't, because it's important. Go back. So, we did a research on what policies do governments have across the EU on sharing and reusing. That's not the same as open source, because there's many ways to share and reuse, but open source makes it really easy. And it concludes that basically all EU member states, including Bulgaria, have policies that address sharing and reuse. And about half of the member states have legislation that make it easy, and half of those so half the member states either list all the open standards or they have a policy that actually instructs governments, public administrations, to share and reuse software. All right, the top three most visible open source implementations. The French Gendarmerie, 72,000 Ubuntu, Linux, and LibreOffice desktops. You can read the quote, and while you read the quote, I'll tell you the anecdote, because this is, how did this start? That's really cute. There was a, one of the IT guys was at home with his Ubuntu desktop and his LibreOffice installation, and he was doing something I think that had to do with the salary administration. He was trying to figure something out. Something wasn't working, and he was doing it at home. And he brought it into work on his laptop, LibreOffice, Ubuntu, and one of the Microsoft guys saw it. And the Microsoft guy ran to the general, who was the head of that department, said, Ubuntu, LibreOffice. And the general called both of them into the office, to hear what was, the, what was going on, why was, uh, there was some, uh, a little bit of a discussion. And the IT guy just, you know, he rotated his laptop, he said, well, it's free, and it does the same, I fixed it, it works. It's free? Yeah. Oh, maybe we should roll this out to the whole company. That's how this started. And here's another funny story, is that the same guy told us at a conference uh, years ago, and he said, um, so we, we ran a proprietary desktop system, and France has a lot of territories in Oceania off the coast of Australia. One of our colleagues would you know, fly to Australia, take the boat to 
uh, whatever, and then row from island to island to update the virus definitions for all the police desktops. He would be gone for a year, and he would come back, we'd give him a new disk set, and he could go again. Now we have a wound, we don't have that anymore. He's not flying. Second desktop is the government of Spain. They're not done yet, but this is their target, 42,000 desktops. What they have done is that they have 10,000 PCs in all of their healthcare organizations. 22,000 PCs in government offices will be running Lingobex, it's a Ubuntu version. And this is what I mentioned, the schools. And then they, where am I going? They had a, um, recently a procurement request for um, proprietary software licenses for schools, and it made everybody in Extremadura that is in favor of open source very nervous. Don't rush me. And um, anyway, that procurement request was from the previous government. The current government decided not to cancel it, but they promised the open source community in uh, Extremadura that it will not replace. The schools will continue to use uh, open source. And the third biggest one is uh, Munich. 14,800 desktops and the rest. It's a complete uh, open source stack. And this is the interesting anecdote you need to know. Um, Christian Ude, he, the former mayor, he was in uh, California, I think, for a conference. And he doesn't speak a lot of English. You need to know this. And I heard him tell us this. I was right there. And he said, uh, so Bill Gates called me and he said, uh, I hear you're in California. Maybe I can bring you to the, uh, you're, and you're leaving tomorrow. Maybe I can bring you to the airport. And at least we have 30 minutes. Yeah, yeah, that is good. And uh, so big van with dark windows arrives at the uh, hotel and the mayor goes in and there's Bill Gates, the richest man in the world. And they start talking and Bill Gates sort of launches into this question, why are you doing this? And Bill Gates, uh, sorry, Uda, again, he doesn't speak that much English, he, has, he thinks a little bit. Yeah, to gain freedom. F freedom from what? Again, 500 meters pass, from you. And the rest of the trip was silent, according to Uda. <coughs> they didn't speak. Uda was, um, uh, later uh, Steve Bomer flew to Munich, or, or they met somewhere else, I don't know. Again, you have to remember that he doesn't speak that much English, and he had practiced a little bit, and uh, Steve Bowman was saying, you know, I'll fix this problem for you. I'll give you a discount here, and I'll make this cheaper, and I'll do that for free. And Uda, and what else? Well, I, um, also for your schools, and I can give you exchange for less, and I can do this, and service support, and maybe for three years instead of for five years. And what else? And so, Bomer later said to, to uh, Nelly Cruz, one of the European commissioners, man, that Uda is a tough negotiator. <laughs> let's, um, I have to rush, but let's go uh, to the two open desktops that are the biggest. So you need to know in France, uh, they have a, a way to make this happening at the moment. ODF is the government standard for documents. And that means that all the ministries, and they have, they have a less, little bit less than 20 ministries, a lot of the ministries, almost all of them, are moving to ODF rapidly. You now have 500,000 desktops at the ministries in France that are doing this daily. So these are the numbers, and it's literally everywhere. They have an interministerial working group. The, these people test open source software and say, you can use this version of Firefox, but not that one. You can use this version of LibreOffice, but not that one. They make this available on a DVD and on sticks and everything. I already mentioned the gendarmerie. And the second big implementation is Italy, the second country where this is really massive. Again, it's a politically uh, very uh, patched country, but the numbers are quite, um, I'm not done yet, dazzling. See, a province here, a province there, it adds up very quickly. And the big hit, a few weeks ago, the Italian Ministry of Defense decided to switch to LibreOffice and ODF2, and that's 150,000 workstations. That makes it one of the biggest in Europe. Some practical strategies, if you guys are interested. Whoops, I'll list them first. Sweden has a very nice way to procure open source. It's very popular in Sweden. It was translated into Germany for the Swiss government. But there they make it easy for public administrations to switch to open source because they can just go to this guy and he will do it all. 
and the guy will take care of the bugs, he will take care of the licenses, he will take care of making things go back upstream, and so on. And it's very popular. Norway, a lot of towns working together on cloud services. I think this is maybe a bit risky, because towns might forget that this is open source, they might forget the, the community aspect of it, but it's, it's growing. The Belgian topic I already mentioned, France, I also already mentioned that they have strong policies, they have a, a good government guideline on open source, and they set the tone. And the United Kingdom, famously, a few months ago, decided to put its foot down on open document format. They actually forced Microsoft to start supporting ODF in uh, Office, because they told the Microsoft guys, if you don't do it, we'll just have to throw you out. How much time do I have? I have no time. Give me one minute. If you want to achieve this, there's five things you need to do. Go look at the UK and do what they do. I already told you, the CIO is fully in support. They made open standards uh, the way to break open the market. And they made it a task for the CIO. Then look at the Canary Islands of Spain. There, the CIO got the political support to any savings that he was able to achieve by going to open source, he could save for himself, so he could invest in his IT to do more, instead of taking it because it's savings and putting it into something else. He had it for three years. Look at the Basque country, the city of Munich, or France, where they make all parts of the IT infrastructure open source, and they promote diversification where they realize that they are basically paying it forward. They're making it public. Look at the gendarmerie. I told you they, for the first time, were able to negotiate with vendors. And this is very practical. Do as the Dutch guys did. They just said, look, we want Firefox. So all our applications need to be able to run in Firefox or else you're out. And that was that. Thank you very much. So this was uh, Kees. Gijs. Sorry about that. It's okay. Gijs. Okay, sorry about I can't that. Help it. Um, if you have some questions for him, because we're out of time, find him somewhere around, ask him.